The Gospel this morning comes from John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of, of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word of Jesus, and the word Jesus had spoken. Every time I read from John a passage like that, I once again reminded that we have to be very cautious about the words uh, when he says the Jews. We have to understand the context in which John wrote his gospel. And it would be some 90 years after the crucifixion. The Jewish community had lost the temple in 70 AD and were trying to discern how they should move forward as a people, as a faith. And of course, the those who believed in Jesus were one group, one faction, and those who believed in some of the more traditional, older ways uh, and did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, te they tended to part ways within the synagogue. See, the, the traditionalists would sit on this side, and the progressives would sit on this side. And so it wasn't really a, a name-calling kind of thing. It wasn't like, oh, well, we're not Jewish, you're Jewish. It was your traditionalist. The Jews were, was the term for the traditionalist. And then those who thought themselves progressive, the Christians, called themselves Christians. So that's the division. It's not an anti-Semitism. It's not a, um, uh, uh, intended to be quite the slur that it would become over the centuries. And it certainly wasn't intended to generate the kind of bigotry and hatred and uh, violence of Christians towards those of Jewish descent. So I want to make that very clear. And when you read the, anything in, in uh, John or any other place, that's what we're talking about. Okay? And it's not a racial thing, and it's, and it's not intended to be a violence thing. So having said that, we have this story of Jesus talking about, John is telling us this story, about Jesus talking about the destruction of the temple. And he's talking, it says about his body, about his resurrection, as a sort of a proof of the legitimacy of Jesus as a Messiah, a irrepressible spirit. And that it's about not the physical structure, but the spiritual structure of faith. He's squinting. Do you, you see what I'm saying? I, I got to check with you. We're not talking about a building. Jesus isn't talking about a building. He's talking about a faith, a belief system, a structure, a way of living. And he's contrasting that with those who are wrapped up in the physical building, in the temple. That's the point John is trying to get across here. <clears throat> it's how the temple is used. And here's another way this passage can be kind of confusing. If you followed carefully, I have heard people tell me that this is Jesus legitimizing the use of violence and force against others because he drove them out. But if you read the passage carefully, he drove the sheep and the cattle out. And you do use a switch to drive sheep and cattle. He's not, dry, he's not hitting people with, a, with, a, with a, a whip. It isn't happening. It doesn't say that. We have to be careful. We make those assumptions. I'll bet a, I did for years. A lot of people hear that passage. They think Jesus is driving the money changers out. Now, he overturns their tables. But doesn't do violence to the people. He says, what you're doing is wrong. You're getting all wrapped up in all this extra stuff. You know, you, you, the temple would not take the coin of the realm. It had to be Jewish coin. And so the money changers would change it. Now, we in the West are very pragmatic and practical. Would you really expect the money changer to change coins, which is required by the temple, without making a little profit? Should they be doing it free? Think so? Hey, Mark, I need a room addition. Would you do it free? <laughs> 
In our world, we, we expect, and in their world, they expected it. So what's going on here? The priests of the temple had a very difficult time, and they sought a pragmatic solution to their problems. You see, they, they are a captive people, captive of a foreign empire. How do you survive? How does a temple survive, keep its traditions alive in that kind of environment? How do you keep the Romans from destroying the temple, which they'd done in many other cities that they'd conquered? How do you figure out how to survive? And they came up with a solution to, to get al go along to get along or get along to go along, whatever that phrase is. They decided to cooperate to the extent they had to with the Romans to keep them as far away as possible. And so some of those activities that were part of the empire worked their way into the temple culture. They acquiesced as a pragmatic way of surviving. They weren't willing to die for their faith or, or even to lose their positions of power. And by the way, priests got paid pretty well in those days, not like today. They got paid a lot. They were wealthy. They were part of the ruling class. They had a lot of power to lose too. And, and, and they tried, in all fairness, when we read the history, they tried to keep things going the best they knew how. And that they knew was that the temple, the building, was what it was about. And so all of these structures get built up around the building. And Jesus comes along and says, it's not about the building. It's about the spirit. It's about your relationship with God and with one another. And of course, the temple authorities, who were so heavily invested in what they had, didn't like to hear that message. And in a sense, Jesus is saying, you know, we can do without this temple. We don't need this building. What we do need is to live in the spirit of God. People have come to misuse the temple and forget about its real purpose as a place to worship. It tended to take back seat. Now, I've seen this happen, and we have all seen it happen in the, in the church. It's not just in the temple that this happened. I had a gentleman in a previous appointment who very proudly said, the reason I come to churches is a good day to dress up and see and be seen. And he meant it from the bottom of his heart. Is that what it's about? Another gentleman, same appointment, pointed to the, the American flag in the sanctuary and he says, I hold that above everything. <laughs> what do you do when God is in second place? How does God rule from second place in your hearts? What happens when the empire comes in conflict, the ways of the world comes in conflict with God? Do we go along to get, to get along? Do we adopt the ways of the world? Or do we find ways to resist, find ways to keep God in front and on top? This is what Jesus is talking about here. That there's become this whole attitude that we, we come here for reasons other than for God. To see and be seen. Think about meetings. I've always had this, I've never done it, but I've always wanted to have this plaque. I'm never going to have this plaque. <laughs> Won't need it. But... It would say on it, and sit on my desk, and it would say, what does this have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And it would be printed on both sides. How much of our energy in the church is spent on things that have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What percent would you attach to it? Most of you have sat through church meetings, or potlucks, love those potlucks. But what percent of the church's effort is about learning and practicing the gospel of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? Do we spend 5% of our energy or 10%? But I would guess that 90% of what we do at least has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came to that temple and he saw that almost everything had nothing to do with God's good news, he became impassioned. And probably this act is the one that set off the events that would lead to the crucifixion. In this time of reflection, I suggest we set off events that lead to the crucifixion. Because it's through the crucifixion that we demonstrate the power of God. Because it's necessary for a resurrection. There is no resurrection without a crucifixion. There is no new life without a death. And the church needs new life. We all need new life. So the question maybe we could ask ourselves as we make our daily decisions is what does this have to do with the gospel of Jesus? And then conform and transform so that our thinking and our actions are in harmony with Christ. When they're not in harmony, it's, the word for it is dysfunction. We live dysfunctional lives, but Christ calls us to something better. Christ calls us to new life. 
And through faith, you can have that life in Christ's name.